Hi everybody, I'm Miss Bovey. I'm Miss Hardy. And today we are going to be talking about the Industrial Revolution and this is part one of a two-part series. So the first thing we're going to look at is this really spectacular development of the Industrial Re Revolution in Great Britain, but it happens in Great Britain for a, a, it's one of those weird times in history where so much goes into making the perfect storm for this to happen in one country only. Uh, and so we really need to look at what are the various reasons for why Great Britain is really the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. So let's start with geography. One, it's an island nation located on the Atlantic. And so they have easy access to water that gives them a distinct advantage. Plus, they have a lot of colonies in other areas, which give them not only the resources within their own country, but access to additional raw materials in other countries. So when we look at that, the American colonies are huge, and also India with the British East India Company. That private joint stock company is essentially ruling India right now uh, and giving a lot of the cotton India's you know, prime export over to England. And we'll also see a lot of other natural resources that England itself has. It has a lot of coal deposits. And so when we start looking at a new invention like the steam engine that needs that as an energy source, Great Britain already has it. They also have iron production, which will later be used in steel production, which allows for larger bridges, taller buildings, stronger ships. You get the picture. So these two natural resources will really be the backbone of what will sort of shape what becomes the Industrial Revolution. But in order to really have a revolution, you need to have people uh, to, to bring that forward. And so when we look at um, Great Britain, we're kind of at the, the cusp of an agricultural revolution where we have new innovations in seeding and plowing uh, that allows technology to take a prime role in agriculture, which means a lot of farmers are out of jobs. That coupled with England enclosing all of its land uh, made it to where public farmland was no longer available. And all of these farmers who had depended on that for their livelihood or have lost their jobs now due to new farming technology are now moving to the cities ready and looking for work. And I want to talk about two additional factors for why Britain. Britain has lots of rivers which allow for cheaper transportation of both raw materials and then finished produced goods which will allow for, like I said, easier distribution. Uh, Britain also has the largest fleet of ships in the world, which will allow for them to trade with other countries easier. And then, and this I think is sort of the linchpin to it all, they have a stable government. That even though we've got some revolutions happening in other places, and although they have fought the American Revolution by this point, their government in their country is very strong and stable, even if there are conflicts in their colonies. And this allows for all of this development to take place. And I think it's important to note that sometimes in history we talk about different topics um, outside of chronology and we, you think that, oh, the revolutions have happened and now the Industrial Revolution is starting. But in reality, a lot of history has blurred lines. And so even while the French Revolution is occurring and most of continental Europe is at war with France to try and replace their, uh, their monarchy and, and keep the French Revolution from spreading to their, to their own nations, we have this Industrial Revolution that's occurring in England. Now, one of the big uh, historical thinking skills that we need to focus on, and we haven't spent a lot of time talking about this year yet, is the idea of periodization. Mm -hmm. And we, this, the Industrial Revolution really is a perfect example of a turning point in history where things are radically different from the time period before. So, Ms. Hardy, what are some of those things? How do we look at a turning point? How does that process look? So when we think about a turning point, we need to think to what extent did this event change the world? And so when you try and think and pinpoint where AP World History test writers would create this essay from, you need to think about an event that didn't just affect one region, but affected many different regions, uh, because that's where you're going to get a lot of your argumentation piece from. And so when we look at the turning point, we have to evaluate to what extent did the Industrial Revolution change the world? What was life like before and what are the ways in which this turned human history on its head that led us to this next wave of development? So are you saying that this is kind of like a comparison? You're just comparing the period before the event with the period after the event? Absolutely. Would that be an easy way to describe this? It's kind of a combination of your compare and contrast essay with your changes and continuities essay. That's really what a turning point essay is. It's that really happy place between the two skills. 
So I want you to be thinking about that as we talk about the Industrial Revolution, not only in class, but in the two podcasts that we make. What was life like before, and how is it now different than that time period? All right, so let's dive into some nitty gritty. <laughs> so uh, we've talked about the Agricultural Revolution. We've talked about why Britain. Now let's talk about the first place we see the Industrial Revolution, which is in textile development. It's not in steel. Uh, it's not in anything that we think today, like industrial. It was with fabric. Why fabric? Like, why, why is this where the factories get started? So you have to go back to who England's colonies were. So you have America, which is a great producer of cotton, and you have India, a supreme producer of cotton. They have this new cheap raw material. Um, this fabric is actually picking up steam and, oh, pardon the pun, in popularity in Europe as this kind of new fabric that's um, easy to wear, it's breathable. Uh, even today, a lot of our own clothes are still made from cotton. And so we have England that has the raw materials and then they have people in India and America as a waiting marketplace to try and buy these goods. And they have to make it faster because the way they were making it originally was not time effective. So let's talk about the way they were making it. So in the old days, if I picked some cotton or had cotton to make, I would take it and spin that cotton into thread or wool, because most of the time it was wool in England because of the large sheeps and things like that that they herded. So they would spin that into thread, and then once it was spun into thread, then they would dye the thread, and then once the, dye, the thread was dyed, you get where I'm going with this, then they have to weave it, and this was all done in someone's house, typically. This was known as a cottage industry, or the putting out system. So whenever you hear the term cottage industry, it means something small on a very small scale, typically done in someone's home. And when one or two people are working on this, as you can imagine, it will take sometimes years to weave one rug at the speed of one person weaving. That's just how long it takes. And so if you have all of these natural raw materials, sort of like invention is like the mother of necessity is that you invent things because you want and need something to be improved upon. This is why the textile industry is going to see a wave of very important inventions. And we're going to start first with John Kay's flying shuttle. And this really speeds up that weaving process, allows, as opposed to one person hammering things down, it speeds it across that thread so that they can do this process much faster. Then what does it lead to? So we have the weaving. We also have the creation of the thread. So how do you turn this raw cotton into thread? Uh, so we have James Hargreaves. He creates this spinning jenny, which helps create that thread. Uh, and then we have kind of the the most important invention, which is from Richard Arkwright. He's often uh, referred to as the father of the factory uh, because his invention, the water frame, creates even better weaving um, for all these fabrics. And, and the, really the point here is, is that the faster you can make something, the cheaper it becomes. And so with Richard uh, Arkwright's water frame, um, it creates fabric at such a high speed that it becomes so cost effective, not only to produce, but to buy as well. Now, the only thing here with this water frame is that it required um, a really a, a heavy current to help move this water mill. I mean, it's a water frame because it's powered by water. I know people are creative when they name inventions, uh, but he required um, a water mill. And so he starts moving these industries from people's homes. Now we're moving them into small factories on a riverbank um, that are able to be powered by the river. So he moves this really from this cottage industry into now a factory. You're also going to see, and you're probably familiar with the invention of Eli Whitney's cotton gin in the United States, which will help um, speed up the picking and separating of the hull from the cotton mm -hmm. in the southern plantation system there as well, which is another key invention of the time. So the big, the big daddy invention of the Industrial Revolution is the steam engine. I always give a little shout out to Thomas Newcomer. He's the one who actually came up with the idea of a steam engine. However, we do give credit to James Watt because he made it an efficient machine. And so your AP test and everyone in the world will say that James Watt invented the steam engine. So steam engine, if correct me if I'm wrong, operates on the burning of coil coupled with that, that, isn't that how it works to create steam and water? Right, so you have to have those coal deposits in order to fuel the machine. And so this is where Britain's uh, plentiful resources of coal come in handy. And all those river 
causeways. Absolutely. But the key distinction with steam engines is that all of a sudden now you can use steam for industry and transportation and a factory no longer has to be tied to the river. It can move someplace else so that you're going to get the birth of these large industrial cities as a result of that. Um, but if you're looking at like transportation, all of a sudden we're going to get the steamship by Robert Fulton, which will speed up um, interocean travel. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the train by George Stephenson. And if you see the picture of the early train there on your slide, <laughs> it's not very impressive. But the train will radically shift how quickly people can mm -hmm. move about. And not just people, but also like the manufactured products being able to transport them across a country much cheaper than with a wagon and a cart. So when we look at these inventions, we have so many more, um, especially in the idea of communication. So we have the telegraph by Samuel Morse, uh, we have the telephone by Alexander Bell, and when we even have the radio by Marconi. And so we have this wave of communication technology that now allows us to communicate over vast distances in almost no time at all. But really, I think the turning point or one of the turning points of the Industrial Revolution, Ms. Hardy says with a heavy-handed wink, uh, is the invention of the light bulb by Thomas Edison, because now factories aren't bound to sunlight. Uh, and so that means that you can have a longer working day with, these, um, with the light bulbs. And so because of electricity, uh, shout out to Tesla. <laughs> I always get mad about that too. Uh, but because of that, now factories can run at night. They can run 24-7. Uh, and that's going to dramatically shift um, the, the social life of our factory workers. And begin to think about this. Think about if you've always spent your life living on a farm and now you can no longer work on a farm because of the enclosure acts. And so you begin to work in a factory and all of a sudden now the factory has electricity and so not, you can't just work in that factory during daylight hours. Imagine how much how, or how drastically your life has changed in a matter of decades. Now, it might not just be the same person, but, you know, going from father to son to grandson, like, we're going to see this radical shift in how everything takes place and how even families interact with each other and the amount of time that they spend with each other because of the demands of working in a factory system. And so we start to see an even bigger shift in that with the Eli Whitney's interchangeable parts. So now you're creating standardized parts, and so when something breaks, you're not replacing the whole thing you're just replacing the small part. So it takes out some of the specialization in that work. Then with Henry Ford's assembly line, it you aren't responsible for creating the car. You're responsible for one portion, whether it be putting on the handle onto a door. It is nothing that requires a lot of skill. And so a lot of our skilled craftsmen are now having to do really menial tasks. And that leads to really a loss of individuality in the workplace. And they're having to work at night. They're having to work for very little pay because if you're not doing a skilled job, you're not getting paid for a skilled job. Because anybody, you're, interchange, you're, you're as interchangeable as that part is because Ooh. you do not need any, any significant skills in order to do that work. Absolutely. That's why even to this day, unskilled laborers make the lowest salary because they're replaceable. They're easily replaced. And you have to think, with so many farmers moving into the city, there is always a steady supply of people who are willing to take any jobs. That also leads to a lot of fear on the workers' part. And um, They might be very unhappy, but they don't feel safe even talking to other workers for fear of their um, boss thinking that they're trying to create a union and then firing them on the spot. Right, because if you don't have a job, then you can't pay, you can't feed your family. And so it really goes back to to this life in the factory system. So just to give you an idea, most people's work days were 16 hours long. They had no safety regulations in the factory. There was no idea of a minimum wage or fair pay. Um, and in fact, they went so far as to start hiring children around the age of six years old because their hands were tiny enough to go in and get those hard to reach places in the machines that have no safety regulations on them. And so now we're starting to see factories hiring women and children because, one, it's cheaper than hiring men. And it creates a real strain on the family because now the husbands who are working and, and they're, the social norm during this time period was to do 
um, to have the husband or the male work to where the, the wife and children could stay home, even if it meant living in poverty, that was better than having your wife work. But because their pay is so little uh, and women are getting paid even less than that and children less than that, it really forces a lot of members in these lower class families to have to work, which puts a huge strain on family life. And that's coupled with the fact that we also see the rise of a middle class with these factory owners and business managers who are making a lot of money in the same city that they see every day, who are going off to restaurants uh, to eat meals, who are going to the opera, who are going to plays and musicals. And so we have this stark contrast in, in what the Industrial Revolution has done to two different social classes, and they're living side by side in these huge industrial cities like Manchester. So the haves and the have-nots, because they're spending so much time with each other, this conflict will, well, we're going to talk about that as part of our like second podcast, but you're going to see some of the long-term effects of what happens with that. So let's just sort of look at what life was like before. When people were living on farms, you had fresh air, you had sunlight, you had large working areas, seasonal changes to your work because you couldn't farm all year round because there were natural seasons to how things took place. And you spent a lot of time socializing with your family, with your neighbors, like, and you trusted each other. And like I said, you lived in small areas, maybe two, 300 people in your village at the most. Now all of a sudden you've moved to the factory and you've got massive air pollution, dangerous machinery, um, no sunlight because we have the light bulb and you can work all of this time. The monotony of repetitive work that is mindless in its nature and is not like personally fulfilling. Um, really, and because so many people are moving to the cities, we get the rise of uh, these apartment-like buildings known as tenements, where essentially because they, people are moving to the city so quickly, they just didn't have enough housing, and so they create and build these really cruddy um, apartment buildings that had no building codes, um, no sanitation for the most part. People would just dump the sanitation right out onto the street, mm -hmm. um, where multiple families at times were living in the same one-room place. Uh, and you were lucky if it was just your family in one little apartment and no privacy really because the walls were thin, it was loud, it was crowded, mm -hmm. and you didn't really know your neighbor. These were not the people from your village. It was just yeah. a bunch of random strangers all living in the city. And you're right by the factory. So the pollution in, this, in these cities are terrible. The living conditions are so bad. Uh, and it's really what inspires the work of one of the most prolific authors, Charles Dickens. So his work um, in in Great Expectations and Oliver Twist, it really speaks about this despair and hopelessness of this, you know, the plight of the working class people during the Industrial Revolution. So, of course, the Industrial Revolution does not stay in Britain. Um, as the countries of Europe are closely watch each other for, like, because they're always competing against each other for land and resources and things like that. Um, the Industrial Revolution will first spread to Belgium and then to France and Germany and etc. Mostly because these countries possessed many of the same characteristics that Britain had, which were abundant resources, capital, people, water. Um, but in France, it's going to be delayed a lot because of you've got sparsely populated urban centers. And a lot of that is the effects of the French Revolution and the internal chaos that 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 ensued during that time period. And then with the rise of Napoleon and his warlike rampage across Europe, the focus in France was not on industrializing. They will eventually industrialize, but that is not the focus. One of the unique things that France will end up doing is establish themselves as a luxury brand of high quality products. Brands like Louis Vuitton will emerge during this time period as handcrafted. You could buy a factory produced something but France was known as the individual, high-quality, very expensive thing. So even to this day, if something comes from France, there is this idea that it is of higher quality than if it comes from almost any other country. It's an interesting sort of like side fact about the Industrial Revolution. I love that side fact. So um, we see the Industrial Revolution even spread further. So Germany doesn't even politically unify as its own state until 1871. But once it does, um, it quickly becomes a leading producer of coal and steel. And a lot of the reason why Germany will rise up and become its own country is an effect of Napoleon. So we have this rise of nationalism uh, in Europe, especially in Italy and Germany, that causes them to go, you know, we're not, we're German, we're Italian. And so we see the rise of those states occur. And so with Germany's unification, they become a major player in the Industrial Revolution, just like the U.S. does. 
uh, and so the U.S. will become the leading figure of the Industrial Revolution. We will surpass Great Britain uh, by 1900. Uh, we do this by building a transcontinental railroad. Um, the U.S. itself has such um, vast natural resources that we're able to utilize. Um, and we have a lot of migrations um, coming to America. So we have a lot of immigrants who create a very large labor force for our industrial cities in the north. Which will be really distinct. We'll put U.S. on the map. And the rise of the Gilded Age in the latter part of the 1800s will produce some of the wealthiest people in the history of forever. Um, with the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, etc. Really, the and, only one who can top them is Mansa Musa. Right, and so they managed to utilize this industrial factor of the United States to great, great advantage. Um, and then we sort of see the example of Russia. Russia will also create a railroad with the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which is trying to connect Moscow to the Pacific Ocean. As you can imagine, this is an, a huge swath of land here that they're doing. Um, but with that, Russia is this leading producer of steel, but the majority of their population is still agrarian. Uh, so that's going to lead to a lot of tension between this burgeoning industrial class and the majority of these peasant class who, let's face it with Russian history, the peasants have gotten the short end of the stick ever since Vladimir created Kiev and Rus. They have not done well. Uh, and so even, you know, Catherine the Great, who expanded Russia to the greatest extent where they could build the Trans-Siberian Railroad uh, in a prior time period, she gave over complete control of the serfs to the boyars. <laughs> they have not done well. And so um, in Russia, we're going to see a lot of tension. And, and from this will come one of our major effects of the Industrial Revolution, which you'll have to tune into next time. Now, the, the one outlier to all of this industrial revolution or the spread of the industrial revolution will happen in Japan. And interestingly enough, during the height of the early modern period and the early part of the modern period, Japan is doing its own thing. It has excluded itself from trade with Western Europe and the United States intentionally because they did not trust Western or Western influences or political ideas or religious ideas, but they still traded with and interacted only with East Asia, Japan, China, etc., the islands around them. Um, but in 1863 or mid-1860s, Matthew Commodore Perry from the United States shows up and says, pretty much, if you don't trade with us, we will attack you with big weapons. And Japan recognizes that they have a choice now. They have seen what has been happening to China during this time period. And China has not gotten the good end of their interaction with European countries or the United States. And so Japan does not want that to happen. And I, I'm not telling you very much because we're going to keep that for when we actually talk about these places. But they will change, radically shift everything in their country to say, we're going to be like these countries. We're not going to allow them to take us over. And so they decide to industrialize using foreign experts to instruct their workers and business managers and all of this stuff. And this will radically alter Japanese societies as well. But I'm just going to pause the story here because there's so much more to tell. And so it's much really more. Interesting. It is. So um, we're going to go in depth with the effects of the Industrial Revolution next time with the rise of some new political and economic theories with really what happens um, in the second Industrial Revolution. So we hope you stay tuned for our second part of the Industrial Revolution. Thanks for listening. Bye.